go back this way. Thank you for joining us today. Um, I'm Melissa Ralstad. I'm the Executive Director at the Wisconsin Museum of Quilts and Fiber Arts, and I am joined today by Devin McElrath, also of the Wisconsin Museum of Quilts and Fiber Arts, where I manage the collection and run the educational programming. Yep. Um, we're really excited today to do the program that we have for you called Treasures from the Vault. It's a chance for us to show off some of the things uh, that we have in the museum's collection that we don't get to show very often. When we do an exhibition, it, it's really tied. We try to uh, pull different things from the collection that might fit what we're doing, but the art we have is so diverse, it's not always easy to pull one single thing just from the exhibition. So being able to do a program like this today is a lot more fun because we can pick whatever pieces we want. <laughs> so um, we will basically be doing a show and tell all day. A couple of things, if you do have questions, please type them in the chat. Devin and I are monitoring that. If you are watching us on Facebook, feel free to post those questions on Facebook. Emily is actually monitoring that and she will let Devin and I know. So we do see those questions. We know that you're watching too. And, and if you are watching us after the fact, you can still leave us questions because <laughs> we can still answer them just in chat form. <laughs> yep. So if you um, enjoy the programs that we're doing like this, if you've tuned in to the earlier ones that we've done, you um, know that we're doing these programs right now for free. So any donations that you can make are greatly appreciated. As you can imagine, it's been a, a challenging time for the museum um, and needing to be closed and then reopening. So any donations that you can make help to support programs like this and help to keep things like educational programs like this or even the uh, collections that you're going to see it help us it helps us continue to meet those parts of our mission so we appreciate that so with that let's let's dive into our first show and tell so again these are all pieces that are owned by the museum and one of the questions we do get a lot is and i'm going to start sharing while i'm chatting one of the questions we get a lot is where do we actually get the um uh, pieces from so where do we where how does the museum obtain pieces everything that we have has been donated to us the museum does not have a budget for acquisitions so everything that's come to us has come to us as a donation um, so sometimes it's a family sometimes it's a collector sometimes it's another organization so many paths that find their way to us so this first quilt that we are talking about is a Welsh frame quilt. This particular one dates to about 1842. It's a classical Welsh design done in a medallion format. And I'll actually stop sharing briefly because you can best see it from the back, which is, I believe, what's behind Devon right now. So you can't really see, so I'm going to do the screen share thing where you get to see a picture of it. So. But it's easiest to see that design from the rear because you can actually see, actually start seeing some of the design, see some of the quilting. So much easier to see it from that perspective. I took a lot of pictures this morning so that you could see the quilting. Um, now, we will also be talking about the, um, you do notice that there is some, there is some staining on it. In just a little bit, we'll actually talk about some of the staining that's, that's on there and some of what we've actually done to mitigate some of that staining um, that was originally on there. Something. Helps to share the right thing. All right, so again, overall view of this, the predominant colors that are in this particular quilt are obviously blue, brown, red, white. That blue is more of a fugitive lavender <laughs> than, than a straight blue. Um, although there is some actual, like some blue that's in there too. The red is drawn primarily from a matter, um, and matter is a plant. So it's a plant-based dye 
Matter dyes are some of the earliest dyes that we know about. Um, they were actually used as early um, as 1500 BC. They're matter-based textiles that were actually found with King Tut, for example. Um, they were very popular in the mid 19th century for dyeing um, clothing, for quilts, and it was so popular because you got a real range of different colors. You could get reds, you could get uh, browns, oranges, all sorts of different shades of different things depending on what you were doing and how you were using the matter. So you're, to create those colors, the fabric would be treated with a metal salt solution and then dyed, um, dipped in a dye bath. And the type of metal that you used helped you create the specific color, which is why you could get that real range of different colors. Now, the blue that's in here is known as a Prussian blue. And that's that, um, often we think of it as a dark, really dark blue pigment, but you can get a range of colors, a uh, range of blue. Prussian blue is actually the first known synthetic dye. Um, we tend to think of it more as a painting dye, but it was used in textiles, um, heavily used in textiles. And we name it Prussian blue, or we call it Prussian blue, because at the beginning of the 18th century, it was used as the predominant color in the uniforms for the Prussian army. So German soldiers actually continued to use it in uniforms, especially ceremonial uniforms, right up until World War I. So it was used for quite a while. Um, and it's actually produced using the oxidation of iron cyanide salts. So one of the questions you get a lot is, okay, does that mean that it's toxic? It actually helps to bind to the cyanide. So while I wouldn't lick the quilt, <laughs> um, you definitely don't want to ingest it. Just making contact with it, it, it actually has a pretty good bond with the iron. So the cyanide that's in there isn't actually generally toxic. And then Devin, did you want to mention just what's going on with the fugitive lavender? And when we hear that term or we mention that term, exactly what we mean? Yeah, so um, fugitive dyes are unstable dyes. They're made from pigments that are not are neither uh, light, colored fast or light fast. So if um, light hits them, they can lose all their coloration. And if um, water hits them, they can also lose their coloration. So it's kind of a, it's a, it was a, rudimentary dye where it, it, they just didn't hold. And some, a lot of that um, was often used in morning clothing. So blacks are often not color fast. They're that fugitive dye. Um, so underneath it turns, it tends to turn like a brownish color. Our fugitive lavenders here are still lavender-ish, um, but in each of those little diamond shapes, you can see uh, like there are little splashes of a darker lavender color. Um, that's the part that still retained that vibrant purple dye, um, but most of it, most of the rest of it has leached out, whether that's from light or staining or some sort of use. Um, most of them do fade to tans, so if you look at old morning dresses, um, there's a really cool project um, with fugitive black dyes, and it was a, like an art installation, an interactive one, and there was a woman wearing a black fugitive dye dress, and they just had water rolling on her. So over time, well, over the, the short amount of this interactive experience, the color leached out of the dress and was just this black pool of dye around her. Um, that, so it, it's just, it's not color fast or light fast. So that's it. The fugitive blue or the fugitive lavender and the Prussian blue are what helped date this. But along with that, um, also there's a nice date inside the quilt, um, which I have a, very blurry picture of if we want to swap screen sharing here. Share my screen. And we did have a comment saying that the red seems to have held up really well. Again, depending on what you're using for that, those matter-based dyes, some of those can be fairly colored fast. Um, it really yeah. depends it depended on what metal solution you were using for it, but some of those can be quite colored fast. So Melissa will move into, I'm sure, the story of this one in a minute, but it's got a J in this, J plus C, 1842. Um, and then you can see like little splotches of darker purple in this one. So here's the actual purple. I don't, can you see my mm -hmm. cursor moving? Okay. <laughs> so right below this blob of black 
Um, there's an actual lavender color, but the rest of it's kind of grayish. So, ah, sneak peek. <laughs> we haven't gotten to that one yet. <laughs> Bad at this. Not really, but you know. All right. So Devin alluded to the story in the J plus C. We believe, according to family history, this was a wedding quilt. So the J plus C probably were the couple's initials. And we know that the quilt was actually made by a woman named Jane Bowden. So Jane, that's probably the J, <laughs> most likely the J. The family line is from Western England near Wales, which probably explains why she chose to make the pattern that she did. Uh, the family was among some of the early settlers to Whitewater, Wisconsin, which is in the southern, for those of you who aren't familiar with Wisconsin geography, in the southern kind of central part of the state. And Whitewater itself was a predominantly Welsh um, settlement. And Devin, do you want to talk about how this quilt came to us and the conservation that it needed? This quilt needed a little bit of TLC when we got it. You saw that from this earlier shot. You can see some of the, the staining and that that we have on, had on it. So as far as how we got it exactly, it was just a, a member of the family contacted us and then said, hey, do you want this? And we said, yes, we do. Um, but it was from Janice Wolowicz um, and she, the family early settled in the area. So in general, that's that part. But um, when we got it, the pictures that Melissa has have are actually of the original condition it came in. So it, they're, it's highly stained. Um, and the colors were bleeding in a little bit in areas. So we sent it off to a conservation specialist in um, Chicago, who also is an artist, uh, Frank Connett, who has had art in our museum before. Um, but he works a lot with tech, well, he works solely with textiles and their conservation and his little studio. Um, so he worked on stabilizing those um, large stains because if you have big stains, they can continue to grow over time. So it's mitigating that damage as soon as you can. Um, so let's see if I can sort of show you a little bit. Yeah, you really can't see it anymore, but this stain here was small. So this used to be that dark, dark brown color, and it's now very light faded, but the edges are still, they're still there. You can't get rid of staining completely, otherwise you would end up bleaching out your piece, but that's about all I got. Okay. All right, so move on to our next. I washed my hands before all this. <laughs> Nice clean fingers. <laughs> All right, so the next one um, is a crazy quilt. So this particular crazy quilt dates to uh, about 1885 and it's got 20 blocks with a surrounding border. The blocks have a variety of applique and embroidered designs like this fun spider web right here. And keep in mind, crazy quilts were meant to show off your hand sewing skills, your embroidery skills. So it's fun to be able to see something like this and be able to see all the different types of stitches that you have in something in, in a piece like this. Crazy quilts were also, this, this particular one in 1885, that's kind of the peak of popularity. So 1880s, 1890s, crazy quilts were all their age. Um, so this particular one includes ribbons um, in the quilt. It also includes Stephen graphs. And Stephen graphs are small jacquard weavings that were created, the technique was created by a gentleman named Thomas Stevens from Coventry, England. And it's fun in particular for us to have something like this because it incorporates the pieces directly into the quilt. The museum actually does have a really extensive collection of Stephen graphs that are separate, um, so just on their own and separate. And so it's kind of fun for us to see how people would have used them. The Stephen graphs were primarily like ribbon size, postcard sized, because they were meant as souvenirs. So there's often famous people, there are some political figures, there are events. 
So think about the different things that we pick up, like a, a postcard for, they would have gotten ribbons or that sort of uh, a Stephen graph to represent that and to commemorate that. And then some of those quilters took those and put them into pieces like this one. And they remained popular right up until uh, about 1939. Um, and then the factories in Coventry, England were destroyed by the, during the Blitz um, of World War II. So, and then techniques changed and times changed and people started using different things to commemorate. So we uh, have our first question, which is what does a fabric restorer use to remove stains and how do they apply the cleaner? You have to go to school for that. So I unfortunately do not have the answer to any of those, but I know they're very careful and they use lots of meticulous tiny tools and um, neutraling, like neutralizing pH agents because oftentimes your stains have some sort of altered pH to the, the fabric that they're on and that's part of what causes the degrading. Um, but I did not go to school for that. That is a big, big chemistry degree. Not that I'm bad at chemistry, it's just, that's, it's one of the reasons we did not attempt to clean that quilt ourselves. We, there's, there's a reason the museum actually sent it off for conservation. I will say most of the stains that you're gonna have on like your family quilts, you're not gonna be able to get rid of. Um, and you're gonna do more harm trying to get those stains off than you would just letting the stain be. So unless you want to use a professional conservator, um, we've, we've all heard horror stories. There's been all sorts of horror stories on the news about conservation gone wrong where somebody tried to do something and it did not turn out right. So the first rule of conservation is the same as the first rule of medicine. It's first do no harm. So you have to be able to ensure that what you're doing isn't going to cause more damage or damage down the road. So it's, it's really a challenge. Um, and that's why they need to know. So when Devin's talking about all the chemistry that is involved, they need to know exactly what they're dealing with. So they do tiny little meticulous, testing before they do anything else and i think they had that quilt what it was for a few months wasn't it um, i don't know it came back when i started so yeah, it, i mean they actually had the quilt for several months so it wasn't we sent it away we got it back a day or two later it actually the, the quilt was with the conservator for several months so it just and that depends on the the conservator um frank and company are in chicago so it was somebody that wasn't too far away for us this particular quilt is a, uh, so the one that's up on your screen now is a friendship quilt. So this one dates to 1939 and the colors in particular I think can help <laughs> with the dating. But this one too actually has a block that helps us to date it um, as well. The participants were a friends group from Wisconsin, from central Wisconsin. But obviously this one says that they at least had one friend in Kansas. So we did have some blocks that were coming from other states as well. All of the blocks you kind of see from this do have uh, individuals' names and locations from, you know, this, this group of friends. Devin, do you want to give the story as to where was this a general donation or? Um, it was, well, it was donated while I was here, so, um, oh my goodness, I was just talking to her yesterday. Let me see if I can bring up that email. Um, so, it was given to, um, it was originally a gift to a woman named Ella Kunzelman. My last name is hard and I struggle with everyone else's too, so I'm sorry. Uh, so, Ella Kunzelman and her uh, it was donated to us by her granddaughter. Her granddaughter got it from her mother, who was also very interested in quilting. And then um, she didn't, she wanted it to go somewhere. And so she asked if we would like it. Um, the reason we kept it is because it had, or we accepted it is because we don't have any friendship quilts in this style or this color. Um, and then it also had dates and locations. And those dates and locations are often Wisconsin specific. So I think there's Al Alma Station or Alma. And then there's a New London, Wisconsin, which for me has meaning because that's where my dad's side of the family is from. Um, so sometimes pieces that we accept are kind of personal in a way. Um, but oftentimes like friendship quilts are baskets or you know floral or something like that. And so it was just a unique piece. Um, the way that we accept 
pieces into our collection, which is a question that we got in the comments. So perfect segue, Mary, um, is that we didn't plan it that way. <laughs> yeah, no, you're our ringer today, Mary. Um, <laughs> so um, we have a committee who meet via email mostly, um, and they accept or deny pieces based on what's in our collection, the story of a piece, the condition of a piece, and um, the piece itself, like in general. Um, so if we don't have something in our collection, it's more likely that we'll keep it or accept it into our collection. But if we have 16 of them, maybe we don't. So a thing we always talk about here is how we don't need any more crazy quilts, which is very funny because since I've started, we've accepted about five <laughs> crazy quilts. And every time they come up, we go, oh, we got to accept that one. It's so unique and different. And that happened this last week. And that's one of our very last pieces that we'll talk about because crazy it's quilts are, are almost <laughs> always very unique. But once you've seen one crazy quilt, you feel like you've seen all crazy quilts because they're very similar in setup. But they all have stories and that story is often what's really important to the museum. So um, the one that we're we just talked about having those Stephen Graffs, we didn't have a crazy quilt in our collection that has Stephen Graffs in it. So we had to take that one. And then this next one, I don't want to spoil it, but it's a, here, it's a really um, yeah. it has a story. The story <laughs> is very important. And so that's why we took that one. So our next, this particular pattern is called a pyrotechnics. And this quilt dates uh, about 1890, 1895. And obviously the predominant colors with this one are, are the brown. <laughs> I mean, that, that brown is the really obvious one. But some blues, some tans. So there are a few others that, that are in here. This particular one has a, this particular pattern has a really strong resemblance to another pattern called Farmer's Fancy or Farmer's Delight. The, the real difference between it is, see where my cursor is, this line um, here of the triangles. Usually with the Farmer's Fancy or the Farmer's Delight, there's another round of those. So you'll see two or even three of those. And I also want you to be paying close attention to how many of these little plates are basically in here. Um, because we'll actually be talking, it's very similar to a Dresden plate quilt, which we will have as our next one, just so you can kind of compare and see the difference between the two. So with this one, it's only got 12 of these wedges in between. Um, the pattern was first seen in um, about 1895, which is part of, so this quilt, somebody might have seen this, it was found in a ladies art catalog which was uh, a mail order quilt pattern company. So it's highly possible this, the quilt maker found this quilt, liked that pattern or saw that pattern, liked it and decided to actually make this. And this particular quilt, um, we do know the um, maker of it. So it was made by a woman named Mary Lyon Hawks. And That's an easy name. <laughs> that, that is an easy name. I got the easy name this time. Um, it, it was a Methodist family who was originally from New York and then moved to Wisconsin. And Mary was actually born in Wisconsin in 1867. She eventually moved to Iowa and she actually passed away in Iowa. But this one was made in Walton, Wisconsin, which is near Reedsburg. And again, we get things, as Devin mentioned, and before we get things from individuals, we sometimes get things from um, other places. This particular quilt actually came to us from the Westerheim Norwegian American Museum in Decora, Iowa. So sometimes organizations, if it, it isn't something that fits with what they collect necessarily, they'll actually see if they can find another home for it with another museum, which is exactly what happened with this piece. Mm -hmm. So you can see again those 12 plates here and then the next um, so in a little bit closer shot so you can see what these look like what just a single block looks like and then another one just another color and then this is a Dresden plate so you can see the similarity between these two um, the big difference is the number of plates that you have and also what you see on that edge um, of the plates so with a Dresden plate there is no there are no triangles there. There's no border um, of the on the round, and there are a lot more of those individual um, star. Uh, 
don't know if they're stripes, the points, um, the petals, I guess they're, they're, they are. So this particular Dresden plate is from 1920. I'll give you a close up so you can see just how many there are. This particular one actually has about 20 versus the um, pyrotechnics, which only had about 12. And 20 is, is pretty common. A lot of these are petals, so they're rounded off. Sometimes they're pointed. This one, the artist chose to do both. So there's some rounded ones and there's some pointed ones in this one. This particular quilt um, pattern was really popular in the 1920s and 30s. And you can tell it's those, you know, those nice bright colors that you see there. You see a lot of these colors too on um, grandmother's flower garden quilts. Um, it's a, a similar sort of fabric choice and fabric selection with these. This particular quilt came to us like kind of a circuitous route. So it's part of the Iris and J. Leonard quilt collection at the museum, which is about 20 quilts, if I'm remembering correctly, um, that make up the whole thing. The Leonards had actually purchased the quilt from Bedfellows, which is a furniture store in California in 1987. And they had this large quilt collection, so I said over 40 pieces, that they were looking to donate and weren't sure exactly where to donate. And so they actually approached the Kohler Foundation, um, which is in Kohler, Wisconsin, just north of us. And the Kohler Foundation helps to connect artists um, and collectors with people that might don't like might be recipients of the things that they're donating. And so we have a great relationship with the Kohler Foundation. So when these pieces came in and the Leonards came to them, the Kohler Foundation approached us and said, hey, might you be interested in taking some of these pieces? So we went up, we took a look at the different pieces and we were able to um, select some of the ones that we wanted. And I believe the Leonards actually did decide, they didn't end up giving it the entire collection to us. They did split the collection between us and the Smithsonian. So it was kind of neat for us to be able to say we shared a collection, we share half of the collection with a, another organization like that. But again, just shows we never quite know how something's going to come to us or you know, who's going to approach us or what way that a donor might find to find us. Speaking um, of other big collections. <laughs> yep. <laughs> so this quilt, yeah, yeah, definitely speaking of other big, um, big ones. So this one is a carpenter's wheel. Um, it's from 1904. And obviously red, white, and blue. Um, so very bright colors. It's got 20 12 inch blocks of shirting material. That's what they actually used. And then I've got a close up so you can actually see um, the little polka dots, the blue dots, the red dots that make up the, the different cottons. And then the quilting was done. Although I don't have, yeah, sorry, I don't have a great photo. It's a little hard to see. Um, you can kind of see it was kind of done in a chevron. The quilting was done in a chevron pattern, which you can just kind of see. 1904 is embroidered on the back, um, which also helps. And then again, speaking of collections that come to the museum, large collections, Devin, you want to talk about the Velassons? Yeah, so um, we are one of at least three institutions that host part of the Velassan collection. So um, uh, Helen Claire Velassen um, lived from 1932 to 2012. She was born in Spalding, Nebraska, and she was a graduate of St. Elizabeth's Hospital School of Nursing in uh, Lincoln, Nebraska. And um, her family um, and her, well, her and her husband, Ray, would travel and rescue quilts. She certified herself as a quilt rescuer. So they would go to estate sales and flea markets and she would find quilts that she wanted to keep and rescue and love. Um, and then her husband kindly built her a storage room for all of these quilts that had rolled storage and was temperature and humidity controlled. And I don't know about you, but that's what I want in my life. Um, so he, upon her death, he, she wanted to make sure that the quilts continue to be rescued. So he found different institutions to donate them to. So, um, some of them went to the International Quilt Museum's Education Collection. Um, some of them went to the Smithsonian. 
they took a really, really cool one that I wanted, and that was sad, but Smithsonian, I understand, we bow to them, it's fine. Um, they took a Mary McElwain quilt, and so we have quite a few of hers, and it would have been very nice to add to our collection. Um, and then they gave some to us, and after, so we were the third institution that they reached out to, so we got to pick from about 50 quilts that were left over from the first two institutions that went through to pick quilts. Um, and so we have a small limited space, so we did not take all of them. And some of the pieces that she had in her collection, we already had represented in our collection, so we didn't take those. Um, but this was one of the ones that we did take, and they weren't all quilts. She, we were, one of the weird pieces that she had, I feel like we've talked about previously at some point, um, was this bright orange piano throw. It was velvet and it had these baby cherubs on it and it was ridiculous and I love it and it's awful. Um, so we were the only place that would accept something like that because everywhere else they went to were quilt museums. So he just wanted to find a place for, to remember his wife. And so that's how the quilts ended up here. Um, so we have 17, 16 quilts but 17 objects, one being that giant piano throw. Maybe at the end, I'll try to bring up, I, I made a background for myself of it. And when I'm in the middle of it, it looks like I'm censoring the baby cherubs. So to stick around afterwards, I'll bring that up. Well, and that also explains, I mean, while a lot of what we're talking about today are quilts, um, we do have one piece, Devin gave you that little sneak peek that isn't a quilt. The museum uh, does collect other things beyond just quilts. We actually are a quilt and fiber art museum, so we collect all different types of fiber art. So we mentioned the Stephen graphs and collecting those, which are weavings. So there are other weavings. There are coverlets that are in the museum's collection. Um, we have a lace collection, um, a fairly extensive lace collection. So there are there's knitted pieces, crocheted pieces, cross stitch pieces. So if it's fiber in some way, shape, or form, it is generally something that we will collect, you know, using that criteria that, that Devin mentioned before and the accession that the accessions committee uses to determine. And one of the questions, just explaining that too, one of the questions that we get, while they use that criteria, part of the reason we also say no to some things is because we wanna make sure we're really good stewards of whatever is given to us and whatever we do say yes to. And so we do have limited storage. We have awesome storage. Um, Devin, I think, still thinks that it was a, a present for her for it was a, her it was first a anniversary. One year anniversary present for me. We, we <laughs> do actually have a storage facility. Uh, if you've ever been in like a research library or something, it's got the movable shelving and that, which actually doubled the capacity of what we can have and what we can collect. So the storage area that we have for the museum's collection is is really a wonderful storage area but like every organization um, including the smithsonian <laughs> um, and uh, the international quilt museum and others out there space is always limited so we want to make sure that we're being really good stewards of whatever we have so that means that sometimes as amazing as something might be we do have to say no and other times we get to say yes which is a lot of fun <laughs> <laughs> and a lot of work. Yeah, and a lot of work. <laughs> um, this particular quilt, uh, oh, before we talk about that, so we do actually have a quilt. So Devin, folded or rolled for storage? Folded with padding. Um, science on quilting and how to store them changes every year. Um, but one thing they found with prolonged rolled storage is that it often distorts along the bias based on the heavy pull of the fabric around it. But all storing of fab, all storing of quilts is what space you have and doing anything besides just throwing it in a closet in a heap is better than nothing. So if you have the ability to roll a quilt, <laughs> roll a quilt. If you have the ability to get acid-free boxes and pad out the folds when you fold them, um, that's really great for the quilts. It also helps absorb any of the chemicals and anything on them with the acid-free paper. Um, 
But if, the, if you can't do any of those things, laying them completely out on a bed and making sure sunlight doesn't hit them is a great way to store quilts. Otherwise, um, folding them up and putting them in cotton um, pillowcases is one of the best things you can do for them. So we are, if we could, we would lay them all out, but man, some of our quilts are big and we cannot do that. But so we, we fold almost all of our quilts. And to give you some perspective, um, I mean, flat storage would be ideal in, for every, there is no museum in the U.S. that does flat storage for every single quilt that they have. Um, there are some been, private collectors. But. There are some private collectors that can do that, but there isn't a museum in the country. The flat storage units only fit about 20 to 30 quilts per storage unit, and they cost about 20 to $30,000 per storage unit. So when you have hundreds of quilts and thousands of objects, it's just not feasible to actually do that. So doing something like this does protect them. They in they are in a completely climate controlled separate space. So that collections preservation room that we talked about is actually has independent climate controls from the rest of the building. So and as Devin mentioned, if you can't do that, if you've got a spare bed, that's the best place because that's flat storage. It's essentially flat storage. So it's a great place for you to um, do that and a lot better than having it tucked away. Um, throw a sheet over it though. <laughs> protect yeah, it from especially the light. if you have an animal who's yep. a pain. Protect it, protect it from the light, protect it from critters, even the four-legged cuddly ones that you want in your house. Um, but those are really simple ways for you to actually care for your things. The, we, the museum does um, track how often we're refolding things. So whenever we're pulling something out, it doesn't get folded back up the exact same way. So um, trying to minimize, again, some of those, we're padding the folds, you still get a little bit of a um, fold there. We don't want any crease lines or anything like that, which is why the folds are padded. Now, the next two quilts that we're talking about, um, one is an original, one is a reproduction of the original. So both have kind of a fun story. Both were donated to us by the same, the same person. Um, the date on the two of them, very different though. <laughs> so this is the original quilt and this is an apple pie ridge star quilt. So the quilt, this original album quilt is from about 1880. And this particular quilt was used as promotion and advertising for a shoe store in Cairo, Illinois, um, which is just across the border from Paducah. The store was owned by a couple named William and Grace Johnson. And then following their passing, the quilt was purchased by a woman named Joan Dickerson, also from Illinois, at an estate sale. And then she in turn sold it to Alma Parrish of Grand Rivers, Kentucky. Parrish then sold it to Jerry View of Rhinelander, Wisconsin during the 2000 AQS Paducah show. And as Devin mentioned, one of the things that we're looking at whenever we are accepting a quilt or accepting a piece is that history. Um, does, what, what is the provenance for a, a piece? And in this case, we know start to finish. So yes, it's from 1880, but we actually have documented records, you know, tracing the entire, each change of ownership for this piece, which is great, especially since this piece isn't in the greatest condition. Um, it does actually have quite a bit of wear. And you'll get a close up look of this, but before I do that, just so you can see the two full quilts side by side. So this is the original 1880 quilt. This is the reproduction of it in 2012. And what's really fun when you have something like this and you have an example like this, we tend to think of old things looking old, um, that old things just always look old. But we've got to remember when old things were new, they looked new. They didn't look old when they were new. So it would have looked like this when it was brand new. Um, and when they just made it, it would have looked very similar to this. This is showing a little bit of age. Um, but it's fun to be able to have those just to be able to point out the contrasts and the differences between the two quilts. So what I will will be doing, you'll see the original block first and then we'll show you the reproduction of the block. So you can see both of them kind of back to back so you get a good sense of what they're going to look like. Now Jerry, who donated both of these quilts to us, um, was also a, the one who coordinated the reproduction quilt. 
and she did it with the Liberty Ladies of Wausau, Wisconsin, which is north of us and then donated both of the quilts um, and donated them specifically so that we'd have both examples. So you can see the applique pattern um, here. So this is the original, this is the reproduction, same block. And then there are also uh, folded paper cutouts. Um, a lot of these are taking elements from fleur-de-lis or other floral. So this, you can see some of the wear on this original one where some of the fabric has actually worn away. Um, on the reproduction, you can see just how bright and vibrant this is, what it probably would have looked like new. Um, on here too, you can see where some of the fabric has completely worn away. And then here you can see that same piece where it's completely intact again. So the pattern, the apple pie ridge star pattern, um, has really strong ties to the Maryland Quakers. It also has a lot of different names. So while we're calling it the apple pie ridge star um, quilt, it's also known as a true lover's knot, Kansas snowflake, lobster variation, um, all sorts of different names. It, Quilt pattern names so often depend on where you are in the country um, or where you are in the world. For certain patterns, everybody's got their own name for something. So this is a great example of that because it does have all sorts of different uh, names for the exact same thing, which is kind of fun. I, that was one of the first things I was taught here by Kay, and it was, well, that's probably a variation. <laughs> yep. We're not quite sure. You can't find it in Brackman. It's probably a variation of something else because we know Quilters love to um, improvise. Do their own things. Yeah. <laughs> and they always, they always have. That, that's not a new thing. <laughs> um, so the Apple Pie Ridge Star name for this pattern is thought to come from the Winchester, Virginia area, which is actually known as Apple Pie Ridge. And it was called Apple Pie Ridge as early as 1809. And there are a couple of different stories, fun stories, as to why the name, the region got that, got that name. So one could be as simple as there were just lots of apple trees. So people made lots of apple pies because there were lots of apple trees. Um, some more colorful stories. There were, um, uh, there's a story about Revolutionary War soldiers walking to the ridge on Sunday for apple pie. Another one about um, glimpsing Quaker ladies with pies in their carriages as they were on their way to fellowship worship. We'll, we'll never know the exact reason the name that got attached to it because I don't know about you, but it doesn't look anything like an apple pie. <laughs> um, but for whatever reason, that's, that's one of the stories behind this, this particular quilt. And I see Devin carefully adjusting her computer so that you can actually see the Spoilers. Behind her. We'll do that so you can actually see that a uh, little up close, little um, in real life. In real life. This is not something we could do photos. It's a lot more impressive in person. So this is a peacock dress, a full peacock dress. Um, so it's three pieces, although the leggings are meant. Or, I was going to say, it's actually four pieces. Oh, there's the headpiece then it's five pieces. <laughs> okay, so why don't you say what the, the four piece or the five pieces are? Okay, then. so it's got a coat, it's got a, a half skirt, it's got harem pants, and then it has a bustle and a peacock feather clump. A dress so. thing. <laughs> so the um, entire ensemble was made by an artist named Kimberly Massapist Evans. For those of you that are familiar with the museum um, or have done some um, other things with the museum or seen other exhibits with us before, she's also the artist who made the Henry VIII um, garment. So she was known for her, her intricacy in design, known for the beading work that she did. And to give you an idea of just how intricate this particular piece is, there are over 2,200 individual scallops on this dress. Um, so between the bodice and the skirt. And you can see, so each of those individual um, little scallops on, so that's the bodice, the one that showed before the beading, 
um, is on the skirt. And again, it's meant to mimic, it's called the peacock dress because it's meant to mimic a peacock. So the bodice is meant to mimic the, the head and the neck. The skirt is meant to mimic the tail of the peacock. But she was um, an award-winning fashion um, and wearable art artist. So she competed and submitted pieces to the, both the Bernina and the Fairfield fashion shows. Um, she won different awards at both of those. So it gives you an idea of just how, again, detailed some of her work actually is and just how many pieces went into creating something like this. And if you like this piece, um, yeah. what? Oh, spoiler. Spoiler. <laughs> <laughs> if you like this piece, if you want to see it in person, this one actually will be up starting August 7th. So you will be able to see that piece at the museum starting in August 7th until about the middle of November. The um, museum actually has an entire collection of Kimberly's art. Her husband, Kimmel Evans, actually donated the pieces to us following her passing. So she was in California for a while and then they lived in Tennessee. So he drove up with an entire trailer full of work from Tennessee. So he, he actually rented a big U-Haul and drove all the stuff up to the museum. And then basically told us to pick whatever we wanted, that we were allowed to pick and choose whatever pieces we, we wanted to have. And so the accessions committee, just like with the Vlassons, we didn't accept everything. We, we selected a variety of different things, but we ended up with 23 different ensembles from the collection, including this one. So we had somebody that was asking if they could see the front. So this is what the front, I don't know where Devin went. <laughs> this is what the uh, front of that dress looks like. We will, when we're exhibiting it, we'll most likely show it from the back just because of that um, skirt and the just sheer intricacy of that skirt. So the, um, Pants, the other things were meant to be worn. Again, whenever she was doing this, she did them as costumes. So it's full outfit. Um, so she did them as completed pieces and full outfits. Devin's giving you a, a closer look so you can see. All for fine details. Some of the other pieces. <laughs> Some of the other pieces that we um, got from her, so we did get, the, again, a Henry VIII, who she actually portrayed in beadwork all six of his wives. Um, she also created a Puff the Magic Dragon costume and a variety of other wearable pieces. So like I said, there were 23 different ensembles that the museum have um, got as part of her collection. And then her husband, he spent, I think he spent about a weekend with us, and then he took everything else back home. So he was just really excited to have something that was, and somebody who really appreciated what she had done and, and the artistry and work that had gone into the pieces that she had created. So the next one we'll talk about is a velvet crazy quilt. So, um, this crazy quilt dates to about 1905, um, and as you can see, while technically it's a crazy quilt, it's not quite as crazy as a lot of the other crazy quilts um, that we have or that used to seeing. So it's a, a fairly unusual look to it and, and a little bit more uniform than what you typically see with a, a crazy quilt. So there are nine blocks. Um, each block is 27 inches by 27 inches. It's a, the top is cotton broadcloth and with silk velvets, and then the hand embroidery is all done with a faux cotton. So you can see what the, so even with this one though, you can see the variety of different types of embroidery stitches that were used with this. This piece was donated to the museum um, by a woman named Mary Jean um, Thaliker. Ah, you got a hard one. <laughs> <laughs> Not too bad though, that one is a little bit easier. Um, and John and Judy Radke of Wisconsin had actually given the quilt to her. And so this quilt was fashioned by John's great-grandmother, Klump, um, using old velvet dresses and scraps. 
So uh, his grandmother, or great-grandmother, sorry, lived on the south side of Milwaukee in a mostly Polish neighborhood, although our notes say she was German, she wasn't Polish. Um, John actually said that he remembered seeing this quilt on the back of his grandmother's settee in her parlor. And his grandmother, we even have her name, her name was Elizabeth Wedman, her husband was Emil. And fun part of the, the story is, while he does remember the, it being on the settee in, in the parlor, he also remembers nobody was ever allowed to sit on that, and the window shades were always kept drawn. Um, which probably explains why this is in as good a condition as it is. <laughs> it does. It definitely does. <laughs> now, the last one that we have for you, Devin will have to share and do the photos for. So yes, it is another crazy quilt. Um, like I said, this one, uh, you go, we have enough crazy quilts, which we also say for grandmother's flower gardens, but I have also accepted at least two of those in my three plus years stay here. So never say never, story. never yeah. say it ne like truly never say never because the story that came with this one was just too amazing to pass up. Um, so the, the piece was really kind of incredible just because of the story alone. Um, this is also the newest acquisition that the museum has. It's not even a week old in our custody. So, so we got so it last Saturday. It's not, it's not a accession yet. Yeah, we got it last Saturday. Um, and I've been working on exhibit stuff. So it will be, this will be in our next exhibit. So you can see it up close if you'd like to, but I'll show you some pictures in a minute. Um, so. This one turned around really fast. The family was, they emailed, and then I sent it to my committee, and then they emailed back and said, hey, we're doing our estate sale this weekend. We need to know if you want them. And so I had to call my committee and go, please choose, because I want this. Um, because I have sort of a say, but I don't really have a say in what we take. Um, that's what the committee does. They're impartial. Otherwise, you know, I pick whatever I want. Um, I would have this, wanted this anyways. Um. This, this particular quilt, uh, 1906 to 1908, um, the quilt maker was a woman named Letitia, uh, excuse me, Letitia Finn Patterson. And the reason that we wanted this quilt so bad, um, the reason we were so excited about it is because it has a really, really fun tie, not just to Wisconsin, but to the Ringling Brothers Circus. So you kind of might wonder, okay, how does a quilt have any sort of tie to, to the circus? Um, the Ringling Brothers Circus actually wintered in Baraboo, Wisconsin, which is where the Circus Museum is and why the Circus Museum is in Baraboo, Wisconsin. So um, that was the winter, their winter headquarters. So that's where they kept all the stuff. That's where a lot of the people lived over the winter. The circus um, uh, performers and acts lived over the winter. So as a child living in Baraboo, um, there's a... a Genevieve, a woman named Genevieve Patterson Norgood, who was the maker's daughter, so Letitia's daughter, she would be sent next door. And she would be sent next door to collect fabric and fabric scraps. That neighbor, so that next door neighbor, Mrs. Gorman, was a dressmaker with the Ringling Brothers Circus. So Mrs. Gorman would bring home all the leftover satins and velvets from the costumes that were worn by the circus performers, and then she'd share them with Letitia. Um, Letitia. So Letitia then used these scraps to make this beautiful piece pattern with um, the strips of fabric. They are set on the diagonal within the blocks, but it's just really a, a fun tie. So this quilt is made entirely out of the scraps, um, pretty much entirely out of the scraps from the costumes from the circus performers um, and from the costumes that she created for the circus performers. It's also kind of fun for us because young Genevieve grew up to be a quilter herself. So she followed her mom's example and kept on quilting too. She would make friends with tailors and then use the leftover sample books, um, even making a log cabin from those scraps that is owned by her daughter, Nancy. So this particular quilt was also kind of fun for us because we had documented this quilt. So the museum does documentations several times a year, um, trying to encourage you all to capture the stories behind the quilts. You know, the ones that we're talking about today, these, these are ones that were either passed down through family history or people wrote down these stories. 
and we were able to capture these stories, but so many of those stories are lost. And so this particular one, the family had actually brought it into a documentary documentation really early on. And so we actually have a lot of the records for, or we have some of the records for this piece already. So it was fun for us to be able to do this and then have the family come back to us and um, then in turn donate the quilt to us. Devin's been showing you examples and just how neat this quilt actually is. <laughs> I mean, she wrote her name in it, so um, I think her nickname, but mm -hmm. that's fun. My favorite is this fabric. And it's like, it's a very tactile fabric, like very costumey. Um, I can't tell you what it's made out of, but it's really interesting. <laughs> Um, so again, just uh, fun for us to be able to do it, but again, it's the story behind it that was the reason that we wanted a piece like that um, and why we said yes to yet another crazy quilt. Um, but we never know what stories are actually going to come to us. I mean, there's some really amazing things that we've gotten over time. That's part of what the fun is in sharing a, a program like this. So that is the last piece that we had to share with you today. But it's fun to be able to share some of these stories um, with you. So again, a couple of these pieces are going to be on exhibition. So um, the peacock dress and then the, this, the, the one that's currently up will be on exhibition in the, the exhibition. So you'll be able to see these live and in person if you come to the museum um, starting on August 7th. And that's paired with the quarantine quilt exhibition. So the bulk of what will be up in the gallery at that time will be the quarantine quilts. Um, to date, I think we're at 26 or 27 quilts and counting for the quarantine quilt project. We're at 26, 27 is set to go to a quilter this weekend, so. And we have, if you're interested in that, we're not really talking about that too much because we don't want to steal the, the thunder from our next program. So if you, our next virtual program like this will be on Friday, August 7th, which is the opening day for the exhibition. And that program will be all about the quarantine quilts. So you'll have a chance to see some of the blocks, you'll have a chance to see some of the quilts and hear a little bit more about the stories that have been coming to us with some of these pieces. And what all went into actually doing this crazy project. <laughs> um, it's been a lot of fun, but oh, we, we had no idea what we were getting ourselves into, as, as Devin can definitely attest to. But you'll hear more about that on um, August 7th. Again, these programs are free, so we do... Um, ask if you are able to do so, if you want to make a donation to the museum. Um, Devin, if you could uh, post in the chat um, some of the, the links for donating. Um, the museum is also going to be doing our very first virtual fundraiser. Um, it's a, an auction. All the items have been donated expressly for this auction. And you can start previewing the items. Um, I just posted the link for that. You can start previewing the items. It'll go up and live starting on Monday, August 3rd at noon. And then you've got until Friday, August 7th at 2 p.m. to finish your bidding and to make sure that you've got your bids in. But you can start previewing all the items now. So Devin did post the, the link. So again, donations are greatly appreciated. Oh, Emily posted one. <laughs> so, but we greatly appreciate any of the support. Your support helps us continue to be able to offer programs like this. And we hope you join us again on August 7th. We will see you then. Yeah, and I'm gonna show the collections room real quick because okay. I said I was going to. Yep. So this was their one year anniversary present to me, <laughs> even though it was planned before I started. Obviously, there's nothing in it yet. Like at that point, there wasn't. That was brand new. <laughs> this is what it looks like now. <laughs> yeah, it, it, it's a lot more messy now, but this is ideally what it will always look like. Really super clean and fancy. Um, so everything is box level inventoried and all of those boxes can contain between one quilt and three quilts or other textiles. Um, one of their other textiles is usually way more. Like the whole peacock outfit fits in one of those white boxes. Um, 
and they're all acid free and they all have acid free paper and they're all labeled with a number on them and all of the aisles are labeled with numbers and all the shelves are labeled with numbers. So in an ideal world, I can find things. Uh, and then all of that is actually, um, so those labels, those numbers that she's talking about, all of that is then in a database that the museum has. So if you're looking for a piece, it'll actually tell you when you pull the record for that piece, it'll tell you box number, shelf number. So it'll tell you exactly where you can find that particular piece. The pieces that are gonna be on exhibit, um, the records get updated to reflect that it's on exhibition and then that becomes the history, part of the history of that piece because the museum's policy is uh, unless the board specifically approves a, um, an exception to it, that we won't exhibit something if we've exhibited within the last couple of years. And the reason for that is it helps to protect the pieces. So um, we don't want them out, and we want to be able to show off more of what we have. But we do programs like this. So there's actually, uh, this is a, a version of a program that we do with a lot of guilds, actually, um, called Treasures from the Vault. Um, so if you're looking for, once guild meetings resume if you're looking for something like that um, let us know we actually can come to you and bring some of our our treasures with us um, we can also zoom to you which is what we're going yes. to be doing with the guild about dying and tie-dye um, yes. in october that's um, really and it's not the exact same program so each time we do that it is a different program we bring different pieces out um, Devin and i usually have a, a little chat about what exactly we're pulling any given given time for any given program but if you were to look in the record for those, so let's say I'm doing the program, it'll actually say out with Melissa or at Quilt Expo or the, sorry, the Great Wisconsin Quilt Show or wherever we happen to be. So we're tracking the pieces regardless of where, you know, if they're on site, we know exactly where they are on site. If they're somewhere else um, in museum custody or if they're on loan to another museum, the record actually reflects that. And then it also lets us know exactly what we've done with those pieces at, at different times and how often we're using certain pieces and um, make sure that we are, are keeping good tabs and again, being good stewards of, of what's been entrusted to us. So we did get a question, what did we use prior to the new system for the- Really heavy duty industrial shelving units on wheels. That our volunteers actually put the wheels on. <laughs> oh, okay. Al. That was that was that was pretty done. <laughs> no, the, the volunteers actually put put wheels on them so that we could move them around a little bit, but it, it was so, not ideal, and we had a lot of wasted space. Yeah, so these are specifically tailored to what we needed. So each of them are exactly two box levels high and four box levels across, except for the end ones, and those were kind of added just to give us to optimize space in the room. Um, and, but each of those hold two box levels high and but one box level in. Um, so it's tailor-made for our system and with that we have the capacity, it pretty much doubled the amount of quilts that we could hold. So originally when I came in there was no space at all to add new things in and right now we still have one whole unit that is empty. I, mean, I use it for projects but it's not, nothing is stored permanently on them yet. It's just stored temporarily for ease of where I put things. Um, well, and one of the other things, we, there's actually a workspace now where there wasn't before. So, I mean, it wasn't just having additional yeah. storage. The, the revamp of that room gave us workspace. There are cupboards. The museum does have some really big pieces, not just quilts. There are some rugs that we have that are absolutely enormous. And we now have a place to proper, like to actually store those where before we just had them sitting out on, in that room, but sitting out on a table wrapped in a sheet. And so now- oh, Rugs you roll. Roll right, those rugs. rugs. you roll. <laughs> right. So, but they were sitting wrapped on a table because we didn't have another place to put it because we couldn't use those shelves. It would have been too dangerous. And now they actually have a designated place there's a safe storage area for those both safe for us and safe for the, the art so this this accomplished a lot of other things um, it also gave us some hanging storage so for some of the pieces that we have that need to be hung and can't be or shouldn't be um like a lot of the kimberly moss yeah. evans collection those are all hung right. barring this one actually the jacket was hung so I knew where the jacket lived, but I didn't know where the pants and the skirt lived because they were in the system very weird. Um, it, it just said bustle, bustle and pants. So finding them again was 
was a doozy, but now they're going to say peacock outfit. <laughs> but the some and some of the reasons that we might not be able to box it, especially with a lot of the masks Evans, there's structure built into it, like the puff costume. Um, there's a like wire frame or wire frame structure that's built into that. We we can't put that in a box. <laughs> so um, it it's just there are certain things, but we'll use um Devin will pad out hangers and things like that just to make sure that it's it's still being properly stored um, and properly creating stored. boxes for things like our donor quilt is the largest quilt in our collection i don't know how big it is but it's a whole wall yep. here they're only a very high, high wall <laughs> so that one the box is actually like how i said you can fit two boxes one on top of each other that the box for that one is two boxes high, um, just to accommodate that quilt itself. So as you can imagine, there's a lot of uh, figuring things out, but that's the new space allows us to be able to do that. And then the shelves, um, we actually ended up because we didn't, weren't gonna be able to use most of the shelves. So some of them we used for, we actually still use those metal shelves for storage um, at another, for education storage, for some of the materials and stuff we use for the education programs. Um, the other ones we actually sold to the Kohler Foundation. <laughs> so they use those now for some of their projects that are in process. Um, and it works great. They need a space. The space that we have now, we can't shift around. So, I mean, it gave us a lot more flexibility, but those shelves are not moving. Um, you know, they Unless are we want them to. <laughs> we don't want them to. Yeah, they're, they're going to stay in place. The Kohler Foundation, on the other hand, actually needed stuff where they could move their things around depending on what they're doing. They needed a little bit more flexibility. So when they found out that we were looking for a good home for those, they were really excited and they actually bought those. So again, there's a lot of cooperation. We work with a lot of other partners um, a great deal. So. Mm -hmm. And then this year for my third anniversary, they got me shelves <laughs> <laughs> in that storage room. So finishing off that project finally. Um, now it just is down to me to put everything away. All right, well, that's our program for today. We hope you all enjoyed yourselves. And again, tune in on Friday, August 7th, and we will see you then.